That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Oppenheimer, the 12th film directed by Christopher Nolan, which is being released courtesy of Universal uh, July 21st, 2023, the event of the summer. I know I've seen at least one Christopher Nolan film. From start to finish? Uh, that would probably be Inception. Inception. Uh, but he also did Following, Memento, The Prestige, uh, in a, a remake of Insomnia, um, the three Batman films, Tenet, uh, Dunkirk. Am I missing any? That's good enough. Okay. Straight out the gate, I think the subject matter is compelling. The cinematography is fantastic. And the sound editing is spectacular. Sublime even. Yeah, it's... S we saw it in IMAX. It, this, is, this is not a film you watch at home. No, it's I would... I mean, it was breathtaking at moments, so I would definitely recommend seeing it in IMAX if you can. So that's that. I mm -hmm. mean, I would give it a high score just for those three things. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember, Tenet came out during the pandemic, and I just drove to San Diego to see it. That's right. I did not care for this script, though. Sorry, girl. <laughs> so, of course, it's based on a true story, a historical figure, uh, based on the 2005 publication American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin. I think, as I've had an issue with, I mean, as, as a visualist, uh, Nolan is maybe unparalleled in contemporary cine cinema, maybe, but uh, as a screenwriter, no. So the IMDb description for the premise is the story of American scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer and his role in the development of the atomic bomb. It makes it seem like a biopic. It's not. It's really three stories in one. It's about Oppenheimer's role heading the Manhattan Project, which was this four deal, four deal, four year deal uh, where the U.S. government spent a bunch of money to create a nuclear bomb. Not related to the New Deal. <laughs> Then we have the subsequent um, sort of like hearings that took place uh, by the atomic, I believe the atomic, the, the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, I think. <laughs> I could be wrong. No, uh, the two other things that are happening are, uh, and we'll get into it, uh, is a hearing going into... Uh, Oppenheimer has been denied his uh, security clearance, which... That's the AEC Security Personnel Board. They're conducting hearings against him. So that's, part, so that's another part of it. Yes. And the reason those hearings are happening is because Louis Strauss, who was the head of the AEC, mm -hmm. played by Robert Downey Jr., mm -hmm. he's mad at Oppenheimer because Oppenheimer shamed him at a point. So he's made it his mission to basically ruin the legacy of Oppenheimer. But Louis Strauss... There is a confirmation hearing occurring because Eisenhower, then President Eisenhower, has appointed him to be a member of his cabinet. So, of course, the Senate has to approve him. Mm -hmm. So we have that Senate hearing happening. We have the hearings from the AEC Security Board happening against Oppenheimer. And then we have the Manhattan Project happening. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. But the second half of the film really is a splicing or juxtaposition of the separate uh, hearings that Oppenheimer yeah. and Strauss are, are, are undergoing. And I think that is also supposed to be kind of like a great, greater metaphor about the world powers like the Soviet Union and the U.S. Because there's some phrase about them being two scorpions that can kill each other, but they will also kill themselves. So the casting is, uh, there are many, many, many familiar faces. And I felt like the dialogue combined with all these famous faces at moments, this felt like a drunk history skit to me. Sure. <laughs> but I wanted to start with the opening because there's a quote about Prometheus that I thought was really, um, or some dialogue. Can you talk it's about like a that? paraphrase about Prometheus, who's in Greek mythology, uh, of course, brought, he stole the fire from the heavens and brought it down to mankind. And of course, fire is a life-giving and destructive force. And because of him uh, disobeying the gods and giving uh, away one of their secrets, he is punished every day. And it doesn't go into this in the opening, but in, in mythology, a, a liver, a eagle, some kind of bird, I think an eagle, rips out his liver and eats it every day. So I thought that was an, like a strong start combined with the visuals because we get a lot of visuals of what appear to be like particles 
uh, fire, like, you know, space, atoms, I don't know, science, but like very powerful visuals that seem, it's sort of intertwined with Oppenheimer's thoughts. Yes, like in almost a nightmarish way, because he's, he's also being plagued by uh, the invention that he has made that is, that is really a destructive force. But getting back to the beginning, we get title cards early on that happen like in short succession that say one, fission, two, fusion. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a three, four? No, there was this. They, those are pretty much back to back, and then we kind of don't revisit. That. It was very random to Re me. Revisit that again, yeah. Um, and of course, Killian Murphy. Uh, playing, oh yeah, I didn't even say. <laughs> playing Oppenheimer has worked for Nolan before. He was Scarecrow in the Batman film, Batman Begins. So I think Killian Murphy did a fine job. However, I had to research this because we get some time at Cambridge, because Oppenheimer studied at Harvard and then went to Cambridge. And left Cambridge because he wasn't, his learning style and his talents weren't really being fostered there. But he meets another scientist played by Kenneth Branagh, I think. The Danish physicist Niels Bohr, yeah. Who tells him like, oh, you should go here where your, you know, mind will be better utilized. Go to Germany. And that's, and he leaves Cambridge in 1926. So we see Killian Murphy playing Oppenheimer in 1926 at Cambridge. So he's like 22. Mm -hmm. He looks elderly to yeah. be 22. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I know he was a chain smoker, but god damn. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit, speaking of Brana, it's a bit like watching Brana play a medical student in his Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it was giving that. Mm -hmm. um, so Einstein, so Louis Strauss had a school that he was trying to, after the nuclear, after the Manhattan Project, he lured. Oppenheimer to be the head of the de physics department there and that school also had Einstein as a professor mm -hmm. so I think seeing the actor playing Einstein and his interaction with Oppenheimer Tom Conti mm -hmm. was pretty interesting mm -hmm. there is a moment within that that I thought was kind of corny which we can get to there, again I think that's at the script level and also some very obvious dialogue that that is again repeated that be, there's so Florence Pugh plays a, a, a com, one of his communist lovers. Um, I'm forgetting her name, Jean, and who's a philosophy professor, I think, at the same school. Uh, She's a professor. Yes, and there's the, they have this whole thing where he brings her flowers, but she always throws them away. It reminded me of this really bad Michael Roskamp film called The Racer and the Jail Jailbird, where they're like pas de fleur. Uh, but she, she has some. It, it, she's posed as having some mental health issues, but that one they have several sex scenes but in one of them she holds up a book to him in Sanskrit and says read what this is as she mounts him and it's uh, it says something to the effect like I'm a destroyer I'm an eater of worlds and it's like and of course that is repeated later on I like how it's 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 too obvious the first time it's used because, but I like how it's uniting sex and death in an interesting way but I didn't need her at all because this movie's long as hell so I feel like you know if you wanted to trim some fat definitely her that character who's supposed to be like a lover. She, I, I really don't understand why she was significant, really. Well, I mean, of course she has some significance to the story, but not enough that, I don't know. And then that poor lady showed her breast twice. I just didn't think we needed that. Then we get a scene where during the hearings with the AEC security panel board, because they're, they're trying to shame him because they know that even though it's a private hearing, that some of the details will get out. And at a point when Oppenheimer's wife, played by Emily Blunt, mm -hmm. she's in the hearing, this private hearing, so she can bear witness to what they're saying. That's when they decide to bring up the fact that after he married Emily Blunt, he went to go see Florence Pugh. Mm -hmm. And they force him to basically say, like, yeah, I slept with her. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Emily Blunt's upset. And then he's going into his head, like, freaking out. And then we get sort of a fantastical scene where... Now Florence Pugh is naked again, mounting Oppenheimer in this hearing while Emily Blunt's sitting there. Like she's envisioning it. In like her she's. Mind. In, I, I mean, I get what they're trying to do, but I didn't need that. Sure, and she and we come to find she'd already known about that because um, Jean kills herself and he's distraught. And That's there's, right. there's a moment where Emily Blunt is. is made That's to right. Yeah, we get a lot of Florence Pugh that I just. I like her. I, I just do too. didn't yeah. think we needed her. I think I don't. I think Nolan has a hard time. He he seems to like a certain type and of woman in his films and and how he uh, stresses his 
their accents as female characters, and they're always a bit in the background, and I think all of them are here. You have Olivia Thirlby, who's in the extreme background, but Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt are much like Elizabeth Debicki in Tenet or um, Marion Cotillard playing a, a bad woman named Maul in Inception. There's a moment when... So when Oppenheimer is at Louis Strauss's school and he's working with uh, Josh Hartnett, who's like the lab professor, and then Oppenheimer is the theory instructor. Um, one of the students played by Alex Wolf, mm -hmm. we get a scene where he's at the barbershop mm -hmm. and he reads the newspaper and sees that someone else has split an atom. So of course, to these scientists, that's a huge deal. And we see him run out of the barbershop like a crazy person. I'm going to recreate it. That was OTT. There are several OTT. They're trying to stress like how the fervor must have felt at that time. Then we get a scene where, because Oppenheimer and his wife, Emily Blunt, have had a baby. And the baby's stressing her out. Mm -hmm. And they, Oppenheimer just gives the baby away to it one of his colleagues slash friends. And they're like, you're, you're brilliant, you're brilliant. Of course, you shouldn't have to take care of a child. They just give the baby away. And then, and then like an hour later, they get the baby back like nothing happened. <laughs> well, she acts kind of towards the baby like you do towards the cat, whereas she's asking everybody if they want to adopt the Sure, baby. it makes sense to me. Yeah, it, it just seems so like, okay. I think, she, does she call it a rat at one it, point? Like the rat's asleep or something? She says something disparaging. It's like, oh. It just seems so, like, that. I mean, that's such an intense thing that happened that they just kind of were like, yeah. <laughs> Yep. Okay, just we're going to pack it all in. Um, getting back to Einstein and Oppenheimer, I think the corny moment is when all of these students are working together, um, they get... Someone does a calculation. I forget if it's at the school or at the Manhattan Project, but someone does a calculation that posits this nuclear bomb may cause a reaction that reacts with the atmosphere. So, so, so it would be infinite. It would never stop and destroy the entire planet. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was super corny how they're all looking at them. Like they just instantly look at the paper and they know immediately what it's saying. I feel like the science, like obviously the lay person sitting in the theater like myself watching would never come close to understanding the science. But I feel like they maybe could have done a little bit more to explain it. Sure. Because it just seems so like, okay. Mm -hmm. And then when Oppenheimer shows it to Einstein, I thought that was corny because... Oppenheimer says he's not a mathematician and he knows Einstein. They're friends. He knows his work. He's even commented that Einstein's discoveries, he wasn't able to, like he went as far as he could go. Well, he also maybe wasn't interested in going further too. So mm -hmm. when he shows Einstein the math, Einstein's like, well, you know, I don't like, I don't do math like that. I don't know. So I just thought that was so weird. Like, what was the purpose? Like, you, you Oppenheimer, don't know what this really means. You give it to this other person who you already know doesn't know what it means. And then they tell you that they don't know. But, like, you got to deal with it. You're creating this science that could destroy the planet. Mm -hmm. Which I think was the purpose of it all. Yes. But it just seems very obvious. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, so we get the Manhattan Project and we're, we're collecting all these scientists. And Oppenheimer, at this point, is selected by Matt Damon. Uh, the Admiral. Yes, as Leslie Groves. And I thought Matt Damon was well cast in this. Uh, and, yeah. And, and I, I think that there's kind of a broad comedic element that they're trying for. And it only really works with his character and no one else. I agree. There are a lot of times where I felt like, are they trying to give us something? Mm -hmm. And the only time it really worked for me was with Matt Damon's character. On the flip side, though, Robert Downey Jr. as Louis Strauss Something about that was so off to me. And I even wrote down, like, if he got a Razzie nom for this, I would not be surprised. And then the hearing, his hearing, is in black and white. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the well, way it's supposed to be, like, McCarthy era. Yeah. Thing. And I just thought it felt very melodramatic in a corny way. I was okay with it until he has a breakdown moment in the office. This is after Rami Malek playing David Hill has uh, made, his, uh, made it known to the committee that uh, Strauss... Uh, was in collusion against Oppenheimer and he has a freak out session and we have this Senate aide played by Alden Ehrenreich who's kind of witness to this. Who event. I did like. I did like, but he has nothing to do really. But uh, that's where Downey Jr. gets really melodramatic and it feels, that feels OTT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do something neat with, uh, because obviously like, while the scientists are working on the nuclear bomb, of course the US government needs to secure the raw materials like the plutonium or whatever, uranium, I don't know, 
in, in order to uh, create the bomb. So they're getting updates on how much the, the government is acquiring. And so they're demonstrating that to the audience and the fellow scientists. They have these like glass bowls and they're putting marbles in them. So throughout the movie, we see the, the glass jars filling up. I thought that was a really neat representation. I, I wonder if that's actually true, um, but it looked great. It looked great. As far as the scientists that are on that team, I, I was a little... Benny Safdie rubbed me the wrong way as uh, Edward Teller, the Hungarian who... The really dark-haired one? Yeah, who, who's a director. He, Him and his brother directed Uncut Gems, for instance. That's one of the Safdie brothers? Uh-huh. Um, who was in Licorice Pizza. He was also in the... I, he was my... Least favorite part of the Claire Denis film, Stars at Noon, which is a film I really liked. Well, it's I, funny you mentioned him, because I wrote down after that that there are a lot of handsome men in this movie, including him. It, it just seemed like there were a lot of nice-looking guys in this movie, which seemed a little odd to me. Well, a lot of the one who I have nothing to do and I don't need to see. Josh Pack, Jack Quaid, I definitely don't need to see him. Like, what's he doing in there? Um, th there's a whole bunch of people you, you've seen all over the place. David, it's distracting. David Dash Mel, Das Melchian, Matthew Modine, um, uh, James Urbaniak, Christopher Denham, uh, Casey Affleck. Oh, that's right. James Remar. Oh, I thought Casey Affleck, that was, that dialogue, he was fine, but the dialogue felt like they were really trying to give us something uh -huh. and it was not working for me. There were parts of this that reminded me of David Fincher's Mank as well. Also, like men, like, trundling off to the desert to do things. Uh, but Gary Oldman shows up as Harry S. Truman. Well, so after the U.S. bombs Japan twice uh, with these nuclear bombs, the, uh, Oppenheimer's invited to go visit Truman in the Oval Office. And, of course, Truman initially greets him like, you're a hero, you know, uh, th this is the obligatory thank you handshake, like, aren't you lucky you're here, and isn't this great, you're famous. And Oppenheimer's being, trying to be integrous, like, well, I didn't invent this. I worked with a team. Mm -hmm. And also, I feel like I have blood on my hands. And Truman looks at him like, which I actually thought was pretty good. Yeah, that was a good moment. Because he's like, uh, no one thinks you bombed Japan. I did. Like, mm -hmm. everyone's, no one cares about the person who created the bomb. It's me, like, the person who, like, signed off on it. And then, when Oppenheimer leaves... Truman, like in earshot, says, "Don't let that crybaby back in here." Truman, the buck stops here. Uh, he also, when uh, Oppenheimer says that he has blood, thinks he has blood on his hands, he takes out his handkerchief. That's <laughs> right. He's like, "Do you need a rag, like, to wipe it off?" I okay. thought that was a good scene. Yeah, actually. there are very good scenes. Okay, so uh, so the hearing for Strauss, I keep saying his name wrong. Strauss. Strauss to to be appointed to Truman uh, Eisenhower's uh, cabinet. I understand why that was happening. The hearings with the AEC against Oppenheimer, I understand why it's happening because Strauss is trying to ruin his legacy. But if I were Oppenheimer, even his wife is saying, like, I don't know why you're letting them do this to you. This is not a criminal inquest. Mm -hmm. I would have been like, y'all not going to have me sit here and talk crazy about me in front of my wife, in front of my friends and colleagues. I I'm not even showing up. Uh -huh. This is not like an official thing that I have to do. Right. Is the way that I don't know enough about what actually happened because it seems like those hearings are very controversial and lasted a long time. But it just seems to me like the movie is not doing a good job of explaining why Oppenheimer felt like he needed to subject himself to this. Well, because if his security clearance, if he doesn't get that, he it ruined him. He's not able to have the access he needs to continue doing the work he needs to do at but, the level he's doing it. But But he also seems like he... <laughs> I would have liked more of like what this man's M.O. was after the Manhattan Project because we just see that he's out here talking kind of against some of the actions of the government and he's being accused, which we didn't even talk about, of being a communist. Mm -hmm. And so I would have preferred more about that than this hearing that felt very melodramatic it did me. and you have, you have jason clark being very overbearing and aggressive yes. and tony goldwyn there and uh his own who I like his own representation macon blair who who ain't shit as representation as far as well he wasn't well equipped like they, they i mean it was yes. a kangaroo court because he didn't because macon blair as his uh legal representation didn't have the security clearance to even witness the documents that they were using against oppenheimer but this hearing culminates with uh, like, again, it just all of a sudden is like, well, I think we need to have my wife come in and speak, mm -hmm. Emily Blunt. Like, okay, why why do we think she would be useful? And then she comes in, and we're, it's already made clear that she's a drunk. So she comes in, and the questioning starts, and she's acting all, like... Fidgety. Fidgety and doesn't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden, her face changes. 
and then it seemed like she really was drunk. And then she starts like, I don't know, like again, I mean, I wrote down that they really thought she was serving this dialogue because she's kind of like quipping back and forth with Jason Clark. Mm -hmm. And it just wasn't giving what I think they thought it was giving. Like she was cutting him down to size and it's like, This uh, is no, I mean, this dialogue is not the level of like network or no. uh, like, that's what it needed to be for that to work for me. But it, it just really felt like, I mean, this could, that portion of it could have been an episode of like CSI Miami to me in the interrogation room. Like, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the, again, it's just where things feel like we're being led into this a little too easily. There should be, it should, the stakes should feel higher. I don't know. Well, yeah, right. Yeah. I like, I, I just kept thinking, why is he subjecting himself to this? Like, I have, you're not putting me in jail. You're just not giving me my little badge so I can get more info on whatever. Mm -hmm. Move on. Like, <laughs> but, but again, both men are uh, subjected to having their reputations ruined uh, and, and basically because of their own behavior with one another. Um, it's like the two titans against each other. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the film didn't really... The movie should have been about these two men then and these two hearings and what led up to it. But then because there's so much stuffed in, I feel like it's a little watered down and I didn't really care and about are, either man. And what do they keep saying? It's not convicting, just denying. Right, so that's why it's like, if I'm not in trouble, y'all not gonna keep me here. Did we not think it was funny that Josh Hartnett, uh, the star of Pearl Harbor, is also in this film? Oh, sure. Uh, we also find out, well, this is part of history, I guess, I didn't know, but that one of the junior senators who voted against confirming Strauss was JFK. Mm -hmm. And that's part of that scene that you mentioned where Robert Downey Jr. is just going ham. Mm -hmm. My last note is then we get sort of at the end, like what happened to Oppenheimer because Einstein's telling him you're just going to end up like an old man who gets an award. No, who tells him that? Einstein tells him that. Yeah, you're sending up an old man who gets an award and all your colleagues are going to really just, they don't care about you, it's more about them. So then we see all these people who we just witnessed in old like age makeup and I didn't think that was very good makeup. Again, Nolan, I mean, he did that in Interstellar as well. I, you saw that. That's Christopher Nolan? Yeah. Oh, I do like Interstellar. I like parts of Interstellar. Kind of like this film. I, I feel that way about all of his films. It's just like he's, a, a, again, a visionary, but... I, I'm not watching the Batman movies. Tom Hardy's good. I like Tom Hardy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it, it looks amazing. Hoyt Van Hoytema his usual cinematographer who also did great work on James Gray's Ad Astra. Uh, Lud Ludwig Göransson does the score, who did the, at least the first two Creed films and Tenet. Uh, the sound editor, Randy Torres, I think. I, I mean, this, That person should get an Academy Award for sure. The scene where we do the actual testing, I think, is really well done. Oh, you, I mean, just for that, you have to see it in IMAX. The, like, you, because, I mean, I, I was, like, tearing up at, like, just what, like that moment and what it meant for our future and the fear and the destruction. And it was a lot. Mm -hmm. Very well done. It was very well done, yeah. We talk so much shit about this movie, but what would you give it? I would give it three and a half. I would give it three and a half. I thought it was very good. Like everything except the script, I guess. It, it's not something, again, it's just, this is a visual experience. This is not something that you should watch at home. I don't know. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. Oh, 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 oh